How's it going YouTube? Nick here bringing you another rebuild video. Today we're working on a King Cutter 5 foot PTO tiller. What we'll be doing today is we'll be replacing two seals and a bearing that sit within the main drive hub at the bottom of the gearbox. Get ready, we're about to dive into this tiller rebuild. Now that the tiller is nice and clean, it's time to get into the rebuild. Don't do this on jack stands. Do it on the tractor. It'll be a lot easier. We did this so we could film it and have the correct lighting, but it turned out to be a huge pain. Now what we'll be replacing today is the actual seals and bearing that go on the drive shaft that spins the tines. When we found it in the barn one day with a giant puddle of oil on the right side, we knew it was leaking from somewhere. We felt around the housing cover and there was no oil, so we moved our hand to the inside on the hub and that's where the oil was coming from. To get the hub off, we're going to need to pull off the entire gearbox. This starts with removing the cover. Oh, shit. Found the oil. To get the cover off, we put a screwdriver in the top and gently pried until we could fit some punches in there and slowly worked around the side. You can see when it popped off, quite a bit of oil came out, so make sure you have a drain pan. If you have this on a tractor, you can lift it up quite a bit when you go to do this step and drain out all the oil smoothly. Inside the gearbox, there's three gears. The top gear, which comes from the actual PTO, a transfer gear, and then the bottom gear that's on the shaft. We'll start by removing the top gear. Once you clean it up, you'll see a ring clip. Pry that open, pull it off, and then the gear will slide off. Underneath, there's three little washers, a spacer, and then a fourth washer that goes all the way underneath. To get the gearbox off, now we'll have to remove the bottom gear. It's simply held on by a bolt. One quick impact hit and it comes right off. Be careful, there's a washer behind it. Oh! Shoo, looks like none got on the camera. After pulling the bolt and washer, the gear will simply slide off. Now that the gears are removed, it's time to unbolt the housing from the tiller. There are three sets of bolts, one at the top, one at the bottom, and one at the middle. The middle bolts are the largest, and my cordless impact didn't have the blowns to break them free. Unfortunately, my regular impact wasn't around, so we had to grab the giant one. They by no means need that much. You could break them free with a breaker bar if you really wanted to, but we have the power of technology. Don't forget this cotter pin and washer that is on the rear swing door of the tiller. That will need to be removed to remove the housing. Once all of that is removed, we start at the top. There will be six bolts that bolt the cover for the drive shaft to the gearbox housing. The cordless impact had no issue with these. Make sure you keep the top and bottom ones separate. They're different lengths. The bottom bolts are much more difficult to get to. I'd recommend doing them first. We used a breaker bar to break them free and then a ratchet by hand to unscrew them. Once you have all the bolts removed, the housing will just be resting on the hub, so be careful to make sure it doesn't fall off. It also weighs quite a bit. You're going to want to lift this one with your legs. Thinking back, it probably would have been easier to do the top and bottom first and then the middle bolts, just so it didn't have any chance of falling off, but it worked out. This is a great time to clean that housing up real well, wipe off the gears, inspect everything for damage. Continuing on with the rebuild, the next step is to remove the hub. Fortunately, we have a hub puller in the vast array of car tools my father has laying around, so this was an easy step. I've read online about people using a mallet and wood to get these removed. I've never tried it, so I don't know how well it works. Once you have the hub off, clean up the work area, and it's time to work on pulling out the bearing and seals. 
The bearing is quite large as you can see, but it doesn't have very tight tolerances, so it shouldn't be too much work getting it out. Grab a couple blocks of wood and a punch, and you can slowly tap it out with a hammer. You'll just want to work it at an angle on that inside of the bearing, and slowly tap in a circle until it works its way all the way out. Once the bearing is removed, we'll finally be able to get to the two seals that are causing the leak. We'll use the same method for getting the seals out as we did the bearing, just angle a punch in and tap them out. The seals will be very easy to remove, just make sure you take a note of the direction they were in. When we install into the hub there, you'll put the flat portion down into the bottom. Also make sure you clean this side because it is what actually goes on the shaft. Once you get them removed and everything cleaned up, it's time to work on the actual install of the new seals and bearing. To install the seals, if you have a properly sized bearing driver or a perfectly sized socket, that will be your optimum tool. We only have one that was slightly larger and slightly smaller. Because of this, it wouldn't go in straight, so we ended up using a flat head punch on the bottom portion and gently tapped this to get it inside. The good thing here is as it goes in crooked, you can slowly work it in. Just be very gentle and deliberate with what you're doing. Don't Hulk smash this one. Once you have it in and slightly below the rim, we switched back to the bearing driver that was slightly smaller and just worked it in gently. Because two seals go in beneath this bearing, it actually took quite a bit of time to work it all the way to the bottom. You don't want to damage this seal though, or else you're going to have to do this all again, so take it slow. Once you get it all the way in there, double check and triple check that it's actually at the bottom. Throw some grease in and put the next one on top of it. With this one, we thought that we could use the bearing driver and just slowly tap it in. We were having similar issues of it not going in straight enough, so we ended up pulling out the punch to gently put it in again. Once we got it down to the rim, we went back to the bearing driver, then went back to the punch again, and then back to the bearing driver, really just slowly working this one in. After getting the seals installed, the next thing to do is install the bearing. As with most bearings, if you have a press and it's available, you're going to want to use it. So we set this one in gently and then we brought it over to the press to put it all the way in. The press is a little bit of overkill on this bearing. It doesn't have very tight tolerances. When we installed the hub later on, it actually came out slightly and we had to re-drive it in. So don't be worried if you don't have a press. Now that you have the bearing and seals installed, it's time to start pulling everything back together. We used a mallet to start the hub on the shaft and then we used a piece of plate steel with a V welded in it to drive it all the way on there. You might have to get creative because this one's pretty big. You can use the gear to check your depth. You're going to want to make sure the hub's all the way on there so this can assemble correctly. To install the housing, you need to line up the bottom and top shaft with the middle bolts on the side of the tiller. If you have this on the tractor, it'll be much easier to lift up and down the middle portion and then you can use a jack stand to support the bottom. We had to get creative and it ended up not working out very well. I might have it wedged on the bolts here. Keep going, you got an inch and a half. Oh! oh that's my hand. Trying to manipulate this on the ground was sketchy at best, and Dylan's hand ended up paying the price for it. I also don't recommend kicking anything while it's on jack stands, as things can fall off and become less supported. But after this great learning moment, it was time to get back to assembly. The tactic we ended up using was putting a floor jack below the skid and then lifting it up after sliding it on the hub. This was lifting up the bottom shaft with the floor jack until the middle was in place. Once we got a couple bolts in the middle, we used a crowbar to line up the upper shaft. This is where having done it on the tractor and supported the lower shaft, the bottom and the middle portion would already be in alignment and you'd just have to mess with the top. But we figured out a way while on the ground, once you have everything in alignment, you're going to want to torque down the middle guys. We used an impact to draw these in and then the big impact to cinch them down. We are very gentle though not to break these. As I said earlier, the lower bearing actually came out some while driving all this on. We grabbed a big brass punch and slowly tapped around the outside to make sure it was fully seated. Now that everything is in place, we're going to go on and put in the remaining bolts in the top and bottom shaft cover. As I called out earlier, one is shorter and one is longer, so if you put the long one in the short holes, the threads will actually stick out in the housing, so be careful. We got these all threaded in pretty well and then torqued them by hand with a ratchet because that's all we could fit in there. 
Once everything's snugged up and in its proper home, we're going to tap that lower bearing one last time with the brass punch to make sure it's fully seated. Now we're going to install the gears in the reverse order of how we took them off. The lower ones first, it is simply held on by a bolt and a washer. Thread that in by hand and then hit it with the impact. Now that the bottom is installed, it's time to put on the top gear. As you remember, there was a washer, a spacer, and then three additional washers before the gear went on. When we installed this, we tried putting it back together as intended and we couldn't get the ring clip on. As you can see in this close up, the ring clip sits behind those beveled edges. So you know really easily that it won't line up just after you put the gear on if that is covered. We did notice the shaft had some horizontal play, so we ended up sticking a pair of needle nose vice grips in the end to pull it out and create more room. Even with this additional space, we were still unable to put this back together using those three tiny spacer washers. In the end, we ended up putting the base washer on, the spacer, and then the gear, and then putting the ring clip back on. This was the only way we could get it assembled. Hopefully it's fine. I don't foresee any issues with it. There's virtually no play in the gear, but if I'm wrong, tell me in the comments. After you have the inside of the gearbox fully assembled, it's time to put the cover back on. We reused the same gasket. It wasn't leaking before and it's still not leaking now, so hopefully that holds up. After we hand started all the bolts, went around one time with a ratchet and tying them up, making sure they are nice and consistent. Now that we're fully reassembled, the only step left is to add oil. When adding oil to this gearbox, there's a fill marker that's about one third of the way up the case on the left hand side. You'll just remove that and remove the top and then fill oil until it comes out. We used SuperTech SAE 8090 gear oil from Walmart. It was $5 a quart. The gearbox ended up holding about two total quarts. As you can see right now, the oil will begin to trickle out the side. Just put the bolt back in that side and in the top and the tiller is done being rebuilt. I've included some test footage here at the end, but to report back, we have no leaks and our floor is free of oil. Thanks for tuning in to another rebuild video. I hope it's been helpful. If you guys enjoy this form of video and you think it is, please let us know in the comments. Until the next one, see ya.